Uh, it's very good to be able to talk about uh, what this amounts to uh, at a gathering of people connected with Voice of Women, Pugwash, Science for Peace. Um, imperialism, in the sense that it was commonly used and, and rightly met in the 20th century, is obviously still very much alive. Uh, uh, and, and it remained alive, of course, during the period of decolonization, during the era of the creation of the United Nations, uh, the establishment of a world of independent nation states. Uh, and as, at, as, as Harold Innes said uh, in 1949, uh, American imperialism uh, has always made itself plausible and attractive by its insistence that it's not imperialistic. <laughs> uh, and in the 21st century, obviously, uh, with Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, with the crises of capitalism reappearing, <coughs> we're in the fourth great crisis of capitalism right now, with many claims that China is now emerging as an inter-imperial rival of the United States, uh, the old theory of imperialism, uh, as it evolved at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, uh, still obviously has a lot of traction. <coughs> uh, whether it's used in exactly the same type of terminology that Hobson or Lenin used it is not quite the point, but the, the thoughts behind it, uh, the notions that impel it, the notion of uh, empire as uh, the extension of state power, the expansion of territorial rule, uh, of militarism, and uh, inter-imperial rivalries in the context of capitalism. That's implicit in a lot of analyses of the world today. But it's uh, my view, and Sam Gindon's view, saying it not only in this book, although this book is a history that attempts to sustain it. We've been saying it for some, uh, at least a decade. Uh, the old theory of imperialism is misleading if we want to understand American empire uh, and the relation of the world states to the American empire. And what I want to talk about tonight is uh, what I acutely call for the purposes of tonight's talk, the Canadian model. Uh, which takes, should force us to take seriously that the American empire is in fact not imperialistic in the old sense. That it's not just a matter of merely ideologically claiming it's not imperialistic. That it is substantively an imperial and, 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 and actually not imperialistic in the old sense of the term, in the term that was meant by Hobson and Lenin and the theorists who so correctly foresaw uh, the capitalist competition uh, between states that led to World War I. In order to get to this, let me first of all say that, uh, of course, the more common mainstream way of looking at not the voice of women and pugwash and science for peace way looking at the world uh, in the last 20 or so years has been that globalizing capitalism is rendering states irrelevant, is bypassing states. Uh, that what we've been living through in the era of neoliberal capitalism is a matter of markets escaping states. Uh, that states have lost their power to markets, and many people, of course, said in the context of that, that this applied even to the most powerful states, including the Americans. Uh, the central thesis of this book is that this is fundamentally mistaken as a way of understanding the world. Uh, that markets always needed states as their conditions of existence. Uh, states in the sense of courts of law and 
police to not least enforce contracts between capitalists, let alone contracts between uh, workers and capitalists. Uh, and what in fact has been the case through the era of globalization is that states have not been the victims of capitalist globalization, but in many senses its authors. It's not multinational corporations who sign free trade agreements, bilateral investment treaties. It's states that do. Now, the so-called deregulation of markets has in fact involved not a diminution of state rules vis-a-vis -vis markets, but an expansion, of them. an increased codification of the conditions under which contracts are to be observed, the, how they're to be adjudicated, uh, with a much longer juridification, a set of juridification of rules, as markets have expanded <coughs> than has ever been known before. The era we've been living through then is not just a matter of the WTO and NAFTA and international trade agreements. Uh, it has also even been in the domestic arena in the world's capitalist state. Not so much a matter of deregulation as re-regulation. As a restructuring of regulation to allow for the expansion of markets in which the state has been extremely heavily involved at every Now there are states and states. The Canadian state is not the American state in this process. And although the Canadian state has been very active in it, it's been the American state which has played the central role in this respect. Now if you begin with an understanding of the relationship between states and markets, in terms of states being in a capitalist society, dependent on capital for their own revenue, and structured in such a way that they reproduce the class relations of capitalism, not least because they're dependent on capital accumulation, for them, not because some capitalist phones up the prime minister and tells him what to do. That happens, but that's not the fundamental point. Uh, that's why even social democratic and increasingly even communist governments reproduce the conditions of capital accumulation because they're dependent on capitalist markets, not because a capitalist phones them up and tells them. Uh, if you understand that relationship between states and markets in a capitalist society, then one also needs to understand that some states historically have taken greater responsibility than others, and one needs to find out why, for the way in which capital expands beyond borders, as it is inherently tends to do by virtue of its competitiveness and its dynamism. That when capital expands across borders, some states more than others have taken responsibility for sustaining the conditions of accumulation and sustaining class relations internationally. The British state did this most classically in the era of free trade. And not only through gunboat diplomacy and colonization, although heaven knows it did so, right? but also through informal empire. Uh, through the establishment of rules, uh, through informal pressures of trade, uh, uh, so that in the 19th century, the relationship between uh, Britain and Argentina uh, and Britain and the Canadian colonies didn't look all that different in terms of their relationship with the British Empire. One was a directly colonial relationship, ours, until at least 1867, arguably, until 1930. Uh, uh, some might say, arguably, until 1981. Um, uh, Argentina is formally independent. 
what this book attempts to figure out, uh, it was over 10 years in the researching and writing, was what was it about the DNA of American capitalism, about the nature of American society, that made its state so central to the making of global capitalism in the 20th century? We can't read this off from that Smith and Karl Marx. This is something that was historically conditional. It wasn't embedded in the logic of capital. What was it about American society that made its state so central? And what was it about that state's relationship with other states that facilitated this central role? And it's in this sense that I want to talk about the Canadian law. I could get a picture of the conditions in 19th century America that produced this very dynamic economy and the very active state that was involved in facilitating that. Uh, but that's the subject of another uh, lecture. Now, I'm using the Canadian model in a very different sense from which uh, social scientists in recent years have used the Swedish model or the German model or the Korean model the Swedish model, the Scandinavian model, in the sense of here's a welfare state that works, that's both efficient and socially just. The German model in the sense of here's a corporate set of relationships between banks and industry and unions, which facilitates a high export capitalist economy. Or the Korean model, here's an example of a developing state in the global south and the third world which succeeds at export-oriented industrialization via a very active state, which indeed is often coercing its capitalists to be export-oriented and efficient. That's, those are the way in which these types of models are used in social science today. Rather, I mean the Canadian model in the sense of the archetypal, the modular form of international relations in the era of American empire. That's not to say that most states ever look like the Canadian states' relationship to the American in the end, just as those states that have aspired to welfare states didn't end up looking much like the Scandinavian model. But this was the modular form. Let me indicate what I mean by that. Jefferson said, of the American Constitution, quote, no constitution was ever before so well calculated for extensive empire and self-government. And indeed, it was the case that not only did 13 colonies through the American Union <coughs> break from Britain and establish a federal state, so it was indeed the constitute of subunits of the American state that established the federal state. It was also the case that as expansion occurred through the subjugation and extermination of the aboriginal population, uh, through the attempted, in some cases, extension of slavery into areas of the West and even the Midwest, uh, but above all, through the land grabs that were facilitated by Washington through its land grants in the 19th century. Uh, settlements were established as facts on the ground, and before long, those settlers were uh, petitioning for inclusion in the American federal state. And you saw through the continental expansion of the United States, indeed, a example of remarkable extensive empire and self-government in the sense of a liberal democracy as we come to it. And indeed, it was out of that extension that the pressures came for the granting of the vote to all white men, which was secured in the United States before anywhere else in the world in 1835 under Jackson, come out of Tennessee. Jefferson also said, and this is really worth quoting, these days when the Harper government has made so much of the bloody war of 1812. Uh, uh, Jefferson also said in 1812 that conquering Canada 
was the only way of, quote, preventing difficulties with our neighbors. <laughs> Friedrich Engels visited Niagara and then took a boat up to Kingston and Montreal uh, in 1888. And uh, we quote him in a footnote, uh, in a letter he wrote, he'd also visited Toronto on, on that visit, a letter he wrote on September 10th, uh, 1888, uh, uh, from Canada, quote, here you can see how essential the American's feverish spirit of speculation is to the rapid development of a new country, given capitalist production as its basis. In 10 years, this sleepy Canada will be ripe for annexation, by which time the farmers in Manitoba, etc., will be demanding it themselves. In the, any case, this country has already been half an X from the social point of view hotels, newspapers, advertisements, etc., all conform to the American pattern. And however much they may resist, the economic need for an infusion of Yankee blood will assert itself and abolish this ludicrous boundary line. <laughs> so Engels expected uh, that the farmers of Manitoba, just like the farmers of Tennessee and eventually North Dakota had, right, would be clamoring for inclusion in the American state. And obviously, he got it wrong. The idea that that kind of thing would happen uh, was obvious, sustained by the brief moment of colonization by Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, as the Spanish Empire collapsed in, and already collapsed in much of Latin America, but in the Caribbean and Central America, uh, there was indeed a moment in which uh, uh, the American state looked like it was going to engage, both there and then in the Pacific in the type of colonization that Germany, and then Britain is as a rival to Germany, and France, uh, had been engaging in from the mid-1880s, above all through the 1890s, uh, in Africa and, and in Asia. Uh, and it was commonly thought, uh, as the theory of capitalism yielding inter-imperial rivalry was spun, uh, that what was happening was this. There had been a major recession in the 1890s, part of a succession of recessions that had come off, went off on and on from the 1870s on. The Americans were now confronted by what Frederick Turner called, Taylor called the, Turner called the closing of the frontier. Uh, and a great many American businessmen argued in the context of that recession of the mid-1890s that the only way in which capitalism would continue to thrive would be if markets were opened up abroad. This became encapsulated in the State Department's open door policy, which was about trying to secure an open door in the spheres of influence of the old European empire. Applied to China, but it applied much more broadly. And the thesis that the uh, American State Department fostered was that indeed uh, it was in the interests of American workers and farmers. Uh, that this should be so because the frontier had been closed to accumulation in the United States. Now, when you think about how ludicrous that was, although it was the open door policy, at a time when California was still a glimmer in the Hollywood mogul's eye, when, yes, the American state had expanded to the Pacific, but in which accumulation hadn't deepened 
in most of the country. Uh, it makes you hungry. But the great theorists of imperialism, both the proto-Keynesian ones like Hobson, who wrote the first green book on and then the Marxists who read Hobson's book and built their theory of imperialism out of it, operated on the uh, pre-Keynesian premise, which was that it, I mean, you know, it was not a million miles away from Marx's theory of immiseration, that uh, the absence of sufficient demand in the domestic economy of the core capital states would force them to now expand to be able to sustain capitalist social relations, to expand abroad. And that was the explanation of colonization. And moreover, it was assumed that there was a perfect unity between each capitalist class and its state. So when the state acted, it acted for its capital. And that would lead to militarization. And you know, there was a lot of empirical evidence. Uh, to the formation of trust between finance and industry with more and more concentration in each state's capital would lead to this war of all against all between the trusts of Germany versus J.P. Morgan uh, in the United States. And this was Hilferding's famous finance capital was built on. It was very interesting if you go back and look at it, the extent to which these kinds of ideas were actually generated by the writings of American business economists in the 1890s, who were, of course, promoting this kind of thing, but the critics then threw it around. The great radical historians of the United States, whether the Beards by the, 18, by the 1930s or William, Alvin and Williams by the 1960s, who taught so many American radicals, largely accepted the open-door explanation of the American state in the 20th century. They read the State Department documents and believed them. But in fact, as we know, not only did the 20th century not sustain the view that there would be a bloody war to the death amongst the capitalist empire. Kautsky ended up looking more correct than Lenin after World War I. Lenin called his book, after all, right, uh, The Last Stage of Capitalism. Right? Uh, and indeed, uh, it, there's no doubt that the inter-imperial rivalry and capitalist crises produced the Second World War, but the second half of the 20th century saw what was much more uh, what Kautsky predicted would happen a condominium amongst the capitalist powers, a process of decolonization, and above all, what economists, uh, political economists have come to call Fordism in the second half of the 20th century, which was already going on in the United States by the beginning of the 20th century. That is, not the immiseration of the working class, but rather partly because of trade unions, uh, uh, partly because of the right to vote, uh, but also partly because capitalists like Henry Ford recognized that if you paid your workers $5 a day, they might be able actually to buy the car you were producing. Okay. Uh, and of course, Keynesian reforms in the welfare state played a role in this as well. You saw the extent to which capitalism was not driven to expand through colonization, through inter-imperial rivalry, but indeed was able to accumulate to a great extent by realizing its profits at home. Uh, selling to uh, a uh, working class, a middle class, which far from being immiserated, became either through their wages or salaries or through their absorption into the capitalist financial system through credit, uh, became the consumers to a great extent of what advanced capitalist uh, uh, classes were producing. And indeed, uh, ended up, in, by the end of the 20th century, as uh, consumers of a great deal of what third world states were exporting. There were another group of thinkers 
by no means revolutionaries. At the beginning of the 20th century, <coughs> one of them was a political scientist called Paul Reinsch, who Wilson ended up appointing taught in Wisconsin, who <coughs> was a political scientist, who Wilson ended up appointing as his ambassador to China, uh, who argued uh, that it was not the lack of ability to accumulate at home, but rather the dynamic expansion of capitalism, which if it's expanding in North Dakota and California, might as well be expanding in Nicaragua uh, or in Guatemala. It's not a matter of there not being enough investment opportunities at all. Right? It's dynamic enough to spill over and be into Southern Ontario. Right? And the reason that states get so involved, those states that have those capitals that expand, get so involved, whether through gunboat diplomacy, or in the American case, much, much more, uh, through uh, uh, putting advisors into the state apparatuses of <coughs> those other states, and trying to get them to develop laws of contract, courts, police, which sustain contracts, and reproduce capitalist labor relations, right, is that they are protecting the foreign direct investment that flows out of their country. Not because they can't accumulate at home, but simply because capital is, exp is expensive. This was, and I was astonished to find that it was on the exact same page of the uh, uh, footnotes as the Engels quote. This kind of thinking, which was uh, very wisely uh, and not in terms that were a million miles away from the white man's burden, I must say, but nevertheless, <coughs> perceptively, written about by Paul Reich at the beginning of the 20th century, was then articulated by uh, American uh, statesmen. Uh, Elihu Root in 1910, who was the American uh, Secretary of State. Uh, delivered an address to the uh, American Society of International Law, which reads as follows. The great accumulation of capital in the money centers of the world has led to a great increase of international investment extending over the entire surface of the earth. And these investments have naturally been followed by citizens from the investing countries prosecuting and caring for the enterprises in other countries where their investments are made. Each country is bound to give nationals of another country in its territory, the benefit of the same laws, the same administration, the same protection, the same redress for injury, which it gives to its own citizens. And citizens conform to the established standards of civilization. The white mass creeps in this way, right? uh, as contract law in this case. Not as missionaries, but as contract. If any country's system of law and administration does not conform to that standard of justice, no other country can be compelled to accept it as furnishing a satisfactory measure of treatment to its citizens. Now what he was justifying here was intervention in the case that a state was not treating foreign capital the same as it treated domestic capital. And if any of you know chapter 11 of NAFTA, that's what chapter 11 of NAFTA is. Why the Canadian model? Well, Jefferson got it wrong. Engels got it wrong. President Taft got it right. In 1912, exactly a century after Jefferson said, we'll have to annex Canada to have peace with our neighbors, uh, President Taft said that great, quote, greater economic ties had made Canada an adjunct of so what had happened in the interim? American capital did not, in the 19th century, it did much more to parts of Canada in the 20th, but it did not in the 19th century come to Canada for a resource. Didn't. Yes, to be sure, there was, as in this point to note so well, there was a good deal of pulp and paper going down to great mass newspapers uh, uh, of the uh, turn of the century in the great American cities. They came to sell to the prosperous, 
independent commodity producing farmers, the wheat farmers around London, Ontario, who were feeding the stomachs of Europe during industrialization in the late 19th century. The Singer sewing machine was the first multinational company, was the first multinational corporation. And it jumped the, 19th, the 1879 tariff barrier, the national policy, to establish production here in order to sell to Ontario wheat farmers. Established itself as a good corporate citizen. It didn't conquer Canada. Unlike the situation in Central and Latin America, you also had in Canada a high wage proletariat. This was the high wage group. Relative to Europe, let alone uh, the colonies, uh, workers in uh, uh, Canada, for the most part, especially the craftsmen of Toronto and Hamilton and so on, but no more than that, the construction workers, because they could move so easily across the borders, which is why they joined international unions, so they'd have a union card in order to pick up work in Philadelphia. Uh, but also because there was access to cheap land. The farmers of Manitoba, some of whom, of course, came up from Kansas, but a good many of whom came from Ontario. And that made the Canadian proletariat relatively high wage. And it meant that they too were a market for an expanding industrial capital that saw the border that separated upper New York State and southern Ontario right, as something that was easily crossed when you were trying to secure marginal returns in terms of production. Yes, in order to avoid the tariff, you might have to produce inside another country. And it indeed increasingly became the case through the 20th century that when capital moved abroad, it never escaped the state. Right? But it didn't depend on a colony of an imperial state to do the things that states need to do for capital, especially for powerful foreign capital. Police contracts, <coughs> right? have lawyers who can take cases to the judiciary, have the type of, of course, police force that can put down the strike. Right? But it also can regularize labor capital relations. Now, what happens when capital crosses a border is that it doesn't just come as money. It comes as a class force. General Motors and Ford which partly came to Canada, not so much to sell in Canada alone, but to get access to the whole British Empire, because right? they were then inside the imperial tariff. Right? Once they established themselves in Canada, they become a social force in Canada. And indeed, workers for General, Ford and General Motors and Ford make demands upon the Ontario government and the federal government as workers for General Motors and Ford. And it increasingly became the case that uh, uh, capital uh, and American capital was, in this sense, the most mobile in terms of foreign direct investment of any other. The modern corporation was invented in the United States as a legal corporation in the 1870s and 1880s. Most of European investment, especially British investment, took the form of portfolio lending lent as bonds, which had to be paid back by the lenders, whether they be private lenders or states. Uh, American investment increasingly took the form of foreign direct investment. That is, you bought plants or you built plants in another country. Uh, and insofar as that was the case, it was established as a class force in that country. They weren't just lenders in the country. They were producers in the country. And as happened in Canada, the Bay Street banks, very and the Montreal banks, very quickly recognized that uh, it was less risky to lend money to American multinational corporations than it was to small Canadian startups. So you get an alliance between the suppliers to those industries, the bankers to those industries, etc. 
So much is the case that not a lot of capital has to leave the United States. They can raise that capital inside the host country in order to do this. Now, there remains a difference between an independent state, even one as questionably independent as Canada, and a colony. There is a genuine substance to state sovereignty. And even though Taft said that Canada had become an adjunct of the United States due to its economic ties in, in 1912, and indeed Canada was before the introduction of the Federal Reserve in 1912, the only country in the world that used the dollar as a reserve currency, and had already by then the most trade with the United States than any other country on the face of the earth. So to understand what Taft meant by economic ties, foreign direct investment trade, the dollar as our reserve currency, etc. Uh, nevertheless, Canadians defeated Laurier on reciprocity in 1911. Right. And even though the United States did not go into World War I, Canada did. And not merely at the behest of Britain. So it showed you the degree to which there is a relative autonomy in this type of informal empire. And that relative autonomy applied not only to, if you want to call it that, which I began to do it indeed in this very college in 1977 at a uh, conference that Harry Magdock came up from New York for on the American Empire. Uh, if you want to call Canada a rich dependency, which is what I called it then, uh, I published an article on, on it, studies of political autonomy some 30 years ago. Uh, that, that this was also true of countries that were not rich dependencies, that were poor dependencies, that were subject to some gunboat diplomacy. They also had a degree of relative autonomy, uh, such that despite the fact that as the Spanish Empire was driven out of the Americas and such dependent states as were found in the Caribbean and, and the Central America, uh, emerged, uh, not one of them, for all of the rhetoric that the, what the Americans were doing there and putting their advisors in, was creating the conditions for the rule of law and democracy, not one of them spawned a, spawned a liberal democracy. And uh, those American advisors usually ended up being advisors to uh, landed oligarchs or local bourgeoisies who wanted to become landed oligarchs once they made a few dollars. Uh, uh, and, and the type of uh, political system that emerged, the type of economy that emerged for most of the 20th century, did not resemble that of capitalist development. Woodrow Wilson thought with his proposals for the League of Nations that the Canadian model could be extended to the whole world. And that was really most of his rhetoric. And in promoting decolonization uh, uh, through the League of Nations, uh, he hoped that the, what would be established would be what we eventually got with the kind of economic constitution that mapped it, it that the WTO. The American state didn't have the capacity to see that through the Paris Peace Conference uh, in 1918 and 19, and uh, it didn't have the capacity in the interwar years uh, to see that kind of vision through. Uh, the result of that was when the Depression happened, you had a return to interimperial rivalry, better by neighbor policies, tariffs, all of the things that the Wilsonian image of what the world needed right, was a liberal capitalism right, uh, was denied again. But after the Second World War, indeed during the course of the Second World War, and in good part due to the state capacities that were built up during the New Deal in the Treasury, in the Federal Reserve, in the Department of Agriculture, etc., right, you got an externalization of the New Deal in the post-war era. 
And the American state, through Bretton Woods, through the IMF, through the World Bank, but above all, through hub and spokes relations it established with each of the European and Japanese states, began to oversee, as we, the concept we use in the book is superintend, the making of global capital. Accepting that there will be tariffs for a considerable period until the uh, uh, contesters in the Second World War, the main contesters in the Second World War, rebuilt their economies, reconstructed, as the term was known, the period of reconstruction, aided them through the Marshall Plan in reestablishing their economies, and indeed articulated very clearly and openly uh, during the Second World War that it was not afraid of the economic development of its competitors because multinational corporations and domestic ones would benefit from the free flow of capital and free trade. Realizing that this would take a period to install, but that was the point of what was to be the International Trade Organization, it became GATT because the Americans didn't want to accept the restrictions that so many states wanted to put on multinational corporations and foreign direct investment. That's why you didn't get the WTO until 50 years later. Now you can look at this two ways. Uh, I look upon it as the United States gets burdened, gets burdened with the responsibility of sustaining, reproducing, and extending global capital. It is the one state after the Second World War that has the capacity to take that on, that responsibility on. And it doesn't do it in a way, again, where it's instructed by Wall Street to do this. <coughs> Wall Street has to be dragged, kicking and screaming, to vote for Bretton Woods, because they want all the capital from Europe to flow immediately, uh, whatever it can get out of the exchange controls, uh, into New York banks. No, it's indeed very pragmatic American uh, uh, statesmen. Not to say they don't have all kinds of ties with Wall Street, often they, were, they used to be corporate lawyers uh, who play this kind of role. Uh, Dean Acheson goes to the International Lady Garment Workers Union in 1939, their convention, and uh, delivers a speech at the time that Roosevelt is trying to create the conditions in Congress whereby he can take the United States into the war and support it. Uh, and he says to the International Lady Garment Workers Union, insofar as, as, as economic nationalism and communism mean that capitalism is not safe in Europe, the United States itself cannot remain capitalist. Now, what happens through the course of the post-war era is what both liberals and Marxists who were insightful by the late 1960s, began to call the Canadianization of Europe. So it's the term that Raymond Aron, the French sociologist, used, and it was the term that Nikos Poulantzas, the French Greek uh, political scientist, used. <coughs> Whereas Ernest Mandel was in late capitalism was predicting because Europe had recovered, because Germany was now exporting to the United States because Japan was now exporting to the United States, a return to inter-imperial rivalry. On the contrary, what had happened was the Canadianization of Europe. The penetration of, by multinational corporations of European economies, their integration with European finance and with suppliers to those multinational the only really truly European corporations until very recently, because they produced in Spain, in Germany, in France, in the low countries, etc., were American ones. They were Ford, General Motors, etc. The others produced inside the individual countries of Europe. Now, they very much sponsored, the Americans very much sponsored the European common market. They weren't opposed to it. It's not the same that they were the drivers of it, but they never tried to stop it precisely because it was extending free trade and free capital movements. It was facilitating the operation of multinational corporations in a larger market. Now it's very important, as in the Canadian case, not to see this as externally imposed. 
This was what one Norwegian historian has called empire by invitation. It was as much empire by invitation as Bay Street engaging in empire by invitation uh, in, in the case of the American uh, and the European case, all the more, because after the war, many of those capitalist classes were discredited for having cooperated with the fascists. All the more because in a number of cases, they were facing mass communist party. And in any case, as most capitalists, they never thought that social democrats might not end up being communists anyway, if you scratch them, however naive of that was. The linkages then, the strongest linkages of capitalism in the 19th century, the capitalism that yielded the theory of interperial rivalry and the practice of it, the strongest linkages have been north-south between the core capitalist countries and their colonies, or quasi-colonies in the south. What capitalism shifted to in the second half of the 20th century is that the strongest linkages among capitalist states were amongst the advanced capitalists. Economically, that's where the most capital moved. That's where the greatest degree of trade occurred. And obviously, in the military and security arena with NATO and the security apparatus that linked those states. Those were the strongest interstate linkages. And as crises began to emerge, the crisis of Keynesianism and the welfare state, already visible in the 60s and certainly in the 70s, People predicted this would lead to this all coming apart. On the contrary, there was remarkable cooperation and coordination, that's what gave rise to the G7, in the attempt to commonly manage, usually under the leadership of the American Treasury, to commonly manage that crisis. It took a decade until they did, and it took, finally, at the end of the decade, the Volcker shock to break the back through high interest rates of trade union militancy in the United States to guarantee the value of the dollar. Nevertheless, that's what got us out of the crisis of the center, got them out of the crisis of the center. Now, I'll just... Imperialism, I think, on the lips of most people and from the lips of women, by uh, uh, the 1970s, had shifted as a concept. It no longer meant inter-imperial rivalry. Nobody thought the United States was going to go to war with Germany or Japan. Even as German and Japanese investments were great into the United States uh, and so forth, it even as uh, the competition did indeed bring down some American industries. Nobody thought that anymore. Imperialism became shifted to very differently from what it had originally been conceived as the equivalent of underdevelopment and dependence. It was now the core capitalist countries operating in such a way as to underdevelop the global south, to shift the surplus from the global south so they couldn't develop. And the Canadian model certainly didn't apply to that. We were a rich dependency. The Waffle tried to make the case. Carrie Levitt tried to make the case that we were just like the dependencies of Latin. And that was my main critique here at University College in 1977. That was ludicrous. American capital didn't come here only for resources. It came to sell here. And we, in many ways, became a developed capitalist country with classic social relations of capitalism. One could argue, until with uh, import substitution industrialization, that until the 60s and 70s, that the uh, thesis of the development of underdevelopment had some traction, gave us some explanatory power. But with the collapse of import substitution industrialization, of course, encouraged by the core capitalist countries, especially the United States, beginning with Kennedy's trade route, uh, when Kennedy shifted American aid to the third world from direct food grants to loans. And if what you get in loans, if aid is, is in loans, you then have to get the exports to give you the dollars to pay back the loan. So already you get to see the process 
that begins to shift many third world countries towards export oriented development, right? towards coming on board with free trade, right? uh, and eventually coming on board with free capital movements. And through the course, and often driven by economic crises uh, in the 18, uh, 1980s and 1990s, uh, certainly encouraged by the IMF and the World Bank uh, acting uh, in their very close relationship to the G7, especially the American Treasury. Uh, it's a matter of having lunch together. People don't realize how, how intimate the relations really are. Uh, uh, but also increasingly encouraged by capitalist classes in their own countries. Uh, you get third world countries opening up to the types of bilateral investment treaties, uh, to the types of trade treaties uh, that uh, uh, NAFTA epitomizes. And we've seen remarkably, by no means in most countries in the South, but with the ambition on the part of most countries in the South, an attempt to follow the path of Korea, to follow the Korean model, in order to get to the Canadian model. And we've seen a remarkable, a remarkable number of countries of the global south on a classic cap path to capitalist development. A tremendous shift from the countryside to uh, urban industry, a shift from the peasantry to the proletariat, and globalization in a certain sense is just that many more workers around the world for capital to land on, provided it has free mobility of capital. Uh, uh, facilitated always by the role that states play in uh, policing that, in juridifying that, uh, in ideologically creating the conditions for it, etc. So far from the development of underdevelopment, the expansion of capital into the <coughs> global south uh, in the last decades of the 20th century and into the uh, first decade of the has indeed been a factor in classic capitalism. <clears throat> Those regions have done worse that have been <clears throat> most marginal to that process. So it's a bit like how you were off to be employed as wage labor or to be unemployed as wage labor. Well, similarly, what happened to Africa in the last two decades of the 20th century was that it was more or less ignored in this process. Not completely, obviously, but relatively. China's development, which really only takes off with its entry into the WTO, which was dependent on the Americans removing their veto in 2001, under Bush already. Uh, China is the late developer with the greatest foreign direct investment in world history. And it is the late developer most dependent on exports to American markets. The coordination that used to occur between the G7 countries in the face of capitalist crises, which the American Treasury began calling in the 1990s, we're not engaged in the business of failure prevention. Because we're in the business of failure prevention, we get in the way of dynamic, competitive, innovative markets. We're in the business of failure containment. Those markets will inevitably give rise to crises. The role of states is to contain those crises, and to contain them in a way that you get the system going again, without giving rise to bigger my neighbor policies, the reintroduction of capital controls and exchange controls, all the things in the 1930s that interrupted globalization. And there were 72 financial crises in low and medium income countries as they opened up to capital flows and free trade in the 1990s, and they didn't interrupt globalization. The one big case of an attempt at introducing capital control was Malaysia in the wake of the Asian crisis, and it removed them in a year. When this big one blew up, and very interestingly, it didn't blow up because of American trade deficit. 
because Japan or China pulled their loans, uh, their purchases of treasury bonds. That wasn't caused the crisis. The crisis was caused right in the United States in the domestic mortgage market. In the accumulation that had been done at home on the basis of the provision of credit to the American working class. And workers were buying, and increasingly, those workers who've been left out of the American dream, the American blacks, were buying into the American dream on credit. And it was there that the crisis was generated. In the way in which the defeat of trade unionism in the 1970s had given rise to a working class increasingly dependent on credit in order to be able to keep its consumption up, in order to be able to buy all the goods that Walmart was now selling that it was producing in China. And when that crisis blew up, it wasn't the G7 that was called together in Washington, but the G20. Now the word the leading capitalist states of the global south. They were called together by Bush in the fall of 2008. The G20 had been created after the Asian crisis by the American Treasury as a uh, forum of uh, finance ministers and central bankers to meet to try to establish a new financial architecture to contain crisis. Leaders have never met. But in 2008, they were called to Washington and they issued a communique uh, committing themselves to an open economy and committed that whatever their governments did in the crisis, they would not go back to capital controls, tariffs, they would not do anything to prevent the free flow of capital and then when they came here to Toronto in June 2010, and we saw the appalling police riot, what really was going on was that they recommitted themselves to that. The community said, the in 2010, in June 2010, quoted what they said in 2008, said we have sustained this, this is what we've done as governments, and we did the right thing. Now we're not talking here now about the European core capitalist states, Canada and Japan. We're talking about Brazil, China, South Africa. Right? Now, as is the, the case with the Canadian model, these are not by any means mere satrapies, mere adjuncts of the American state. If the Canadian state could vote against reciprocity, if it could decide not to go into a war or go into a war that the Americans didn't want to. Imagine how much more autonomy in the empire China has or Brazil has. Right? But nevertheless, it's bound to the empire in myriad ways through economic time. And increasingly through class time between the financial and industrial capitalists of those countries and America. I'll just end with this. The greatest challenge that this remarkable informal empire that oversaw, superintended the making of global capitalism in the second half of the 20th century, the greatest challenge it faces is how much more difficult it obviously is to turn a country like Brazil into the Canadian model than it was to turn Canada into the Canadian model. The reasons of language, religion, culture, history, you name it. Class structures, state structures. It's a greater challenge than the challenge the old empires faced in trying to keep their colonies intact. And that will be the story of the 20th century. What's notable for the moment as we live through the fourth great crisis of capitalist history, one the late 19th century, the 1930s, the 1970s, and now the one uh, that began in 2007, 2008, which is a long capitalist crisis again. The great, the really notable thing, however, is that that crisis has not thrown up conflict between states. It's certainly thrown up a great deal of conflict within states. And 
we're probably not going to see any breaks from the American Empire, whether in the form of a right-wing economic nationalism or in the form of a new attempt at socialist construction, until there are fundamental changes in the class and state structures of the societies that are now imbricated in the American Empire. The kind of conversation that we have about whether China is going to challenge will prove as meaningless as those conversations in the 80s about whether Japan was going to challenge or Ernest Mandel's fantasy that what the European Union represented was inter-imperial rivalry in the 1970s. Uh, that's not to say that there might not be breaks from the empire. But they would depend on fundamental changes in the class structures and state structures of those societies, which the conditions of crisis might indeed produce. But that's what we need to be looking for, rather than engaging for the moment in rather superficial predictions of is China going to displace or challenge?